This is a panel talking about putting the fun into blockchain gaming. Um, who here has played a blockchain game? All right, that's a, that's a good number there. Um, now, I think one of the misconceptions about blockchain gaming is that blockchain gaming is not fun, it's speculative, it's, uh, it's about a money grab, but you know, we have some amazing panelists here today that are here to tell you that's not the truth and the industry is going a very different direction. Um, so, uh, so let's kick it off um, with intros from the panel. You wanna get a, start minutes. us off? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi, my name is Kwame. I'm a blockchain game developer. I work on a project called Prospectors NFT. It's currently running on the scale network Nebula. I'm also the lead developer and core engineer on Web3 Unity at Chainsafe Gaming. Hi, I'm Ezgi. I'm the product manager of MetaMask SDK. Hey, my name is Dominic. I'm the founder um, of iBlocks. And hi, I'm Topper, and I run Crypto Coliseum. All right, awesome. So hey, I'm Jack O'Haller, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Scale Labs. Uh, we're the core team behind the Scale Network. Um, Scale is a Ethereum scaling blockchain. Uh, there are already 20 EVM chains that live in the Scale Network. Our goal is to make blockchain usable, scalable, and ultimately to create a great user experience. Um, one of the key innovations is that there's zero gas fees for end users in Scale. So there's still an economically viable manner where validators are paid uh, through actually fees paid by application developers game companies, organizations, DAOs, et cetera. Um, we started on this journey back in the end of 2017 and uh, actually started trying to build applications on Ethereum and you know, ran into the typical roadblocks I think most people ran into then. And, um, and my co-founder, uh, Stan, had come up with a model to actually connect to Ethereum and scale Ethereum. And, and you know, our brains together, we realized that by trans, you know, transferring the onus of, of payment and gas fees onto developers that it, it opened up to a whole new UX. Um, I would say, you know, we're finally at this forefront of blockchain gaming and Web3 applications where we can create phenomenal user experiences. And this, uh, this dynamic around, you know, game, you know, anything blockchain needing to be difficult, creating user friction, I feel like is really going away. So I'm honored today to be talking to these builders, um, just some phenomenal people that, that we partner with at scale, who I think are taking an incredibly innovative approach to deploying blockchain games um, or building infrastructure to support gamers. All right. Um, all right. So we're going to start here uh, with the state of the union. Like, where are we with blockchain gaming? And we've got some, you know, I think it's a pivotal point. It's almost my feeling is we're almost at this knee of the curve where the buzz is there, you just walk around the booths area, right? There, you know, a lot of Web3 presence, but we still don't see this, you know, your everyday gamer playing. So my question to the panel is, where are we? So let's have a, you wanna kick us off, Chloe? Ah, yeah, sure. Oh, uh, that's like, that's a great question. Like, where, where are we? Um, I think coming from my background, I started off in like mobile. Um, when mobile games were, you know, kind of getting hot, uh, there was like basically two mechanics. It was like this touch screen and you had like cut the rope and you had like angry birds and those were the type of games you had. Um, now we went into this thing called free to play, right? And, uh, you know, game developers hated it. They were, they were like, like, no, don't do that. In the Web3 world, we were kind of like at that stage of where it was like touch screens and swiping. Um, we have these, you know, non-fungible tokens or avatars, um, but we haven't really gotten to the point where it's a game first and then blockchain later. Um, yeah, I think we are at a weird place with Web3 gaming. Um, a lot uh, can happen very soon. I think there are a lot of new games that are coming up um, or that are being developed uh, that could uh, draw mass adoption. Um, uh, but I think the main problem was that until now, um, there were a lot of missing pieces in Web3 gaming that resulted with either bad games or not even games, but more like DeFi protocols that look like games um, that are constantly focused on tokens and tokenomics of the the experience rather than the actual gaming experience. Um, I think it's um, it's going to change very soon. There are a lot of um, 
new uh, developer products are being made, released, tested, and there are a lot of new games coming up that uh, have the game as a priority rather than the economy that Web3 brings. From my perspective, I think um, blockchain gaming is huge and tiny at the same time. What I mean by that is it's huge when you look at um, activity of, of blockchain games in the Web3 space in total, right? So if you compare um, the top blockchain games um, with other dApps out there, you'll realize quickly that about almost 50% of all the daily active wallets that are really active every single day are in some shape or form connected to gaming uh, in the Web3 space. And that's, that's obviously huge. Um, we have about 1.7, 1.8 million active wallets per day in, in, in the blockchain space, um, if you exclude Bitcoin, um, which are really daily active. You can check these stats on, on that radar. It's a pretty good source for that. And um, when you compare that uh, to, to gaming, that's about 800,000 uh, in the Web3 space uh, who are daily active. Now, looking at all of that, and you can say, okay, blockchain gaming has a, a huge, is this certainly the biggest sector in, in the Web3 space? But compare it to the traditional world out there, it tells you where we are, we are nowhere, right? Like the, the industry is so young right now, and uh, for us that are in the space for, for, for years already, we feel like, oh, wow, the industry matured. Yeah, it did, for sure. But we are still nowhere, like literally nowhere. I mean, compare in gaming, for example, to the top games out there, like PUBG or Fortnite or Valorant or you name it, they have tens of millions of daily active players. And here I am sitting, hey, wow, blockchain gaming is, is huge, right? And we have 800,000 wallets per day connected. I mean, that doesn't even make 5% of one top game out there, right? So that's, that's my take on it. Yeah, um, totally agree with everybody here. And I think what's interesting and cool, it's like, if you look at the beginning of how blockchain games started, it was a bunch of people being like, oh, hey, we can connect graphics to our Ponzi's, right? And what, like, I love Ponzi's, but like, that's not a game, that's like a strange, that's not a game that a normal game player thinks of when they think of a game. And it's only really recently that um, people who think of experiences of fun have started to actually start build and start dipping their toes into the blockchain space. And I think that the sort of end of 2023, um, we'll start to see some of that work come out and I think it's gonna be really amazing to see. And then sort of 2024, 2025 is when the sort of bigger games will start to come out because we've had people working on fun games for about a year or two and people forget that games take a really long time to build, um, especially for the bigger AAA stuff. Um, so I think we're in this uh, point where the technology finally is available though not widely distributed. Um, and that people have been working on good games and we're gonna start to really see this come out. And you can see from the conference, like there's this huge interest in it. Um, and uh, what I think is also cool and interesting, I say it too much, but is that uh, it's the indie studios that are really gonna benefit from this. It's like a new monetization model, kind of like free to play, um, and that the big players are gonna be slow to get into it and that the indie game, the indie developers are really gonna benefit from this uh, sort of wave that's gonna rise. Awesome. So, so more context here. The reason why uh, these four people are here on the panel today is that three of them are have already launched or are launching games in the coming you know, near future. I've seen the games, and uh, I think all of them have taken a very specific approach to say, how do we onboard players more easily? How do we get the not five percent of the top game, but how do we get equal amounts of players uh, to the top game? So, I think you're going to hear some interesting perspectives. We also have. Uh, Esgi with MetaMask, which I think with everyone is plugging into, and I think MetaMask is also doing some new innovative things with gaming to make it more easy to get up and running, um, which, which she'll be talking about. So excited to hear more about that as we go on. Um, now, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about blockchain gaming, and blockchain gaming too, or Web3 gaming, is actually a very, very broad category. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat, so to speak, in terms of how to implement blockchain gaming. Um, I've asked the panelists to, to think about this a bit and, and kind of give us perspective on like, what are the killer features? What are the core components? Because I think if we're all successful, we're not gonna have talks about blockchain gaming. It's just gonna be integrated to every facet of gaming. All the games you see launch and go live are gonna have these killer features integrated. And just like there used to be internet companies and now, all companies use the internet. So I think we're gonna see a similar dynamic. So 
Um, so go, do you want to you go reverse order this time? Let's talk about uh, killer features. Sure. Um, so one that the Web3 industry talks about a lot that I think is misunderstood is interoperability of your assets. So when people own their own digital assets from a game, um, and then they can take them anywhere, right? And so a lot of traditional game studios will say, well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like, I can't take my, like, Halo gun to Mario Kart, right? Um, but I think what's the killer, the real killer feature is if you look at sort of the modding community or the ability to build out in a game ecosystem. Uh, and I, I think recently, we, um, a, a great thought experiment is, so EVE, um, from EVE Online, like the you know, spaceships, they're, they're launching a blockchain game, right? So there's a bunch of pushback, of course. Um, but to me, I was thinking, oh man, so this is a game that's been running for 20 years, right? It's got, a, I think, 300,000 DAUs still now. Um, imagine if the players had owned their own assets from the beginning, and that other studios were able to build additional experiences around those assets from then, I think that would have made that ecosystem much bigger um, and like more thriving and living today. And I think that's really, to me, one of the key components is like allowing real companies and real like come in with and monetize their ability to build experiences around an ecosystem, kind of like an open source model in a way, but with real monetization behind it. I would like to add to that. Um, this asset ownership that you mentioned is obviously a, a huge aspect and uh, a benefit that uh, traditional games obviously cannot provide at this point. And um, I think one very specific aspect of that is um, asset ownership is very good for interoperability and for other things, but also the sheer fact that you can then have secondary market trading um, on, on these assets um, is huge. Right now, there's about $10 billion um, in skins traded in Fortnite and all of these traditional gamings uh, when there isn't even a real marketplace for that. So that actually shows you a bit about the potential of, of you know, um, people wanting to actually um, acquire these assets which they own and uh, secondary market trading in that. There's a, there's a good research from a uh, gaming research studio um, they, uh, New Zoo, they published uh, certain numbers and they did some, some um, questioning uh, of their user bases. And uh, they found out that 81% of all the, the gamers actually would love secondary market trading of their in-game acquired assets. And 75%, so the large majority of these, uh, would actually be willing to pay more for these assets if they are able to be sold again, right? And this makes total sense. You know, I mean, we, we saw, in, I think, a couple of weeks ago, um, a, a CSGO skin sold for like $160,000. I mean, yeah, maybe even more than that. So, so absolutely insane amounts. When you look at it from a perspective that, hey, wait a second, um, I have this skin and um, I, can, I can sell it again. Maybe I don't get the same price. Um, that obviously is, is certainly a motivation for, for gamers to, to acquire more assets, I think. So I, th I think this point is huge. Um, I think I'm going to mention um, an aspect that does not involve um, uh, money effect of the assets ownership, uh, but soulbound tokens is an example of um, how users can benefit uh, in a social way um, between each other, because um, uh, my achievements in a game could be identified as a, as a different version of a token, and then this ha gives me like almost a social status inside the game and and not like every utilization of NFTs and tokens uh, has to be like uh, tied with a money value. Uh, some, uh, uh, some of them are tied with more of a um, social value uh, among the community, among the gamers and um, inside that uh, games, basically, basically like social hierarchy, almost. You beat me to it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say the exact same thing. Um, the verifiability, though, of you know things that a, a character does in the game over spans of years that you play this character and fought these battles and be able to have that verifiability of doing these things on chain is is a game changer. Um, and also with you know like you know, the incentivization with like a token that shows that I did this level on this time and you can actually verify it 
is, is a you know, very important part. Awesome. By the way, I feel like I'm like a professor or something. And I'm just, <laughs> just trying to not stand too awkwardly up here while you answer. <laughs> um, all right. Um, okay. So, and, and by the way, I think we're just scratching the surface. We could probably like go around four or five times. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we'll, we'll go back to that later. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the challenges. So we don't have hundreds of millions of players playing yet. What are, what are the main challenges and the hurdles that you know, we're, we're facing and, and maybe even elaborate a little bit on how, you know, what you're doing to build around that and, and innovate. Uh, the biggest challenges I think uh, still is tooling. Um, I mean, I work at Chainsafe, uh, full <coughs> disclosure, work on Web3 Unity. So we're trying to help, you know, onboard the next generation of game developers in that sense. Um, also, a, a purely defined game mechanics of, you know, what, like where should you add Web3? Or do you even need it at all? And are we doing Web3 or are we Web2.5? We don't, like no one really, really knows. So that part is, I think is the biggest challenge is to make fun games and then make it that the, the game player doesn't know that they're using a blockchain. I think if, we, if we're trying to sell a game around this whole narrative that it's Web3 or it's blockchain enabled, I think we're losing at this point. Um, well, uh, in MetaMask, we recently launched uh, a new product called MetaMask SDK, and we have an SDK specifically for Unity. Um, I think the main problem was, uh, as you said, tooling. Um, we were missing some of the developer products that would allow um, this uh, game economy to be actually to exist inside the game. Um, wallet connection uh, was a little bit difficult for different platforms. Um, and uh, not every game is on web. You know, there are games on desktop, games on mobile, um, and um, there are not really good ways of supporting world connection, hence the, the economy that, co that comes with Web3 games um, on these platforms. So, yeah, my, my answer is wallets <laughs> and any any product that enables wallet connection and transactions and it's a like you know this spectrum of decentralization and ease of use right it's just these yeah. these things pull at each other so it's not an easy problem yeah i think like like my colleagues mentioned um this, this ease of use, what Jack just said, um, and this seamless blockchain integration make players um, not even feel that there's a blockchain part. I think um, that's certainly number one. Um, you know, the, the friction, uh, the, the technicality of, of being able to play a blockchain game um, was certainly um, very difficult in the past, and I think that's something that's gonna change now. Um, from a different perspective, I think regulation is, is a big thing right now for, for Web3 games. Um, that comes especially when you have a, a token uh, in the game as well, uh, not just an NFT. And, and regulation meaning also this, this fiat on-ramp and NFT checkout solutions. Because ultimately, um, like Kwame mentioned, we're like, are we Web 3.0 or 2.5? Um, where we always still connected to the traditional world, to the traditional finance, or in this case, traditional gaming. I think it's, um, it's, it's imperative that uh, the regulator will start supporting it. And what happened uh, in, in the previous weeks, um, my former employer, Credit Suisse, went basically out of business. Um, also driven by what happened with, with SVB here in, in Silicon Valley. Um, I think that put a lot of um, NFT checkout providers out of business as well. And this is a big challenge now, right? Because if you're not launching a completely free-to-play game, but there is like a pay-to-play element in it as well, um, where you, you, know, you need users to, to basically provide some revenues, um, I think that will be a challenge to, to have the regulation in place um, that you can literally onboard um, um, people with credit cards, which... Um, uh, these, so these solutions exist, but if the regulator doesn't catch up there, because there's very weird um, talks from the SEC and from, um, you know, from the European ESMA regulators and, and under MIFI II, um, what they want to do with NFTs, especially that they want to regulate certain points of that. And I mean, when I speak to the regulators and we're quite involved um, with them um, in the UAE and in Europe, and um, my question to them is then, well, can you please explain me 
um, a guy uses his credit card to buy, let's say, an ebook. There is no KYC. He doesn't need to do anything. Literally, you take your credit card and you buy this ebook or digital item, right? And no problem. And then I asked the regulator, okay, can you please explain me why does an NFT checkout provider now or a fiat on ramp provider for a tiny amount? I understand if it's like, okay, let me use my credit card for a hundred thousand dollars. If you have to the limit, then okay. But for like, you know, two hundred dollars, and the guy needs to then verify himself, and and I don't know, half an hour later, he might be. KYC to then invest $80 for a battle pass or, or something that doesn't make sense, right? And where's the difference? And there is no answer. Like, I haven't met a regulator yet that says, no, it's clearly because of this. I mean, they come with the regulation, yeah, sure. But does this really make sense, right? So I think um, one of the big challenges that we will see is um, the regulator catching up and, um, you know, trying to foster innovation and, and not, um, you know, over-regulate certain aspects, I think. Yeah, um, from a high level, I think everyone's already said this, right? It's ease of use and then the regulation of, of on onboarding value. I think that um, uh, there's been a lot of exploration. I think a lot of the limits that we have, especially in the checkout providers, um, is more lawyers' interpretation of missing regulation than it is of bad regulation. Um, and I think there's a bunch of like techniques that are changing a little bit. Um, recently, um, oh man, I forget. One of the, well, it was an NFT drop um, from like a major brand, and there was a little detail there and there that you could get a refund um, for, for 14 days, which is kind of crazy for NFTs, right? Um, but that was specifically because if you buy an ebook in, in the EU, if you buy a digital item, there has to be a 14 day return period. And so they, they, were, they were just lumping it into that regulation, which I think is smart, right? So I think there's a lot of people playing with that. Um, from the sort of ease of use side, I think, like, I guess. Uh, let, me give me a, let me give an anecdote from one of our own games and how hard it was to onboard. And so this is back in 2018. We had um, a game with very passionate players um, on Polygon. And um, uh, we were often the first chain, first thing that someone did on chain at that time. So like our players had experimented with crypto. They like had bought something on Binance or they had bought something on Coinbase. But that was the extent of their of their usage of of, of crypto. And so when they came to try and play a game, one, they often had no idea what the difference between like blockchains was, right? Like to them, Bitcoin and Ethereum were different currencies, but the underlying tech was the same because it was just Coinbase. Um, so to try and sell them like, oh no, you needed to have this kind of token. Okay. So then how do I get that? Okay. First you have to go to this KYC process. Okay. Then you got to, there's no like off ramp onto the Polygon network, so they had to go to Ethereum and then bridge over to Polygon, right? So this is now they're now they're talking about like extracting their coins from Coinbase, uh, buying some Ether and some Matic onto the Ethereum network, and then bridging Matic over to Polygon, which was like also like a two hundred dollar transaction, um, or I think literally a hundred and twenty dollar transaction, and it took twelve hours. Right? So <laughs> this is not a good onboarding experience. Now since then, a lot has changed, but a lot is not. Right. So now it's it's much it's easier to like. Um, uh, get people onto the onto chains and stuff, but still, like, what is a wallet? Um, like, why do I need a wallet? Um, like, do I need gas tokens, right? Like, do I need to go buy something, do KYC to spend gas? And what, what does that even mean? Like, if I if I'm playing a game, I'm not used to like, I, I will I will buy an in-game item, but not this like secondary thing that I need to do other things with the game, right? And it's like all of this stuff we're like figuring out as an industry, um, and we're we're definitely not there. Like we're, we're, we're just at the beginning. Right. And, uh, and that, and I think, um, I'm, uh, there's a book, uh, designing video games where he talks about like when you're building a game and you're a small studio, you get to basically innovate on like one thing, um, like everything else you should could probably like take from other people. Um, and right now we're iterating on this thing, which is, I think is part of the reason why the games have not traditionally been so fun is because we're all iterating on like the onboarding experience for blockchain, which is not a fun thing. Right. But we're getting to the point now where we've iterated enough, we're starting to figure out best practices, and it's going to be exciting, I think. Awesome. Great great thoughts there. So we're going to talk a little bit more about user experience in a minute. I'm going to throw a little curveball, though, because I feel like we have time for it. Um, <laughs> so uh, all right. So I, I was walking around. I saw a lot of vendors or you know product companies selling like user retention products, like, oh, retain more gamers. And, you know, I realized I never hear anyone talk about that in blockchain gaming. It's always adopt gamers. And so just kind of, you know, from your perspectives, um, you know, 
Can you talk a little bit at that, about that? Because it feels like the games are very sticky and the problem's more about the top of the funnel, but is that true? And can you talk a little bit more about those dynamics of adoption versus retention? Because yeah. uh, anybody has a thought? Start, I guess. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, user retention is a huge <coughs> thing, right? And I think um, uh, we haven't seen fun enough games to figure out what that retention cycle looks like. Now, the one thing is like crypto is an amazing uh, social organization tool. Um, and so th that crypto is like a superpower for organizing communities. And that we have seen, right? That we've seen pre-launch games build massive communities um, with people very interested in the game uh, in a way that's like um, what traditional games did with crowdfunding and like founders packs and stuff, but like on steroids because these people are owners of a game. They feel ownership of an ecosystem and they really want to participate. And that's amazing. Um, but, there's a, but in terms of like retention tooling and like the loops and stuff like that, we have a, a long way to go to figure out all that, all of that, I think. I think you, you made a very good point with um, community being um, ultra important in, in blockchain gaming. And I think that's where Web3 games will have a huge advantage um, compared to traditional games, um, mainly because they're very close to the community or should be very close to the community. This asset ownership that we all spoke about, it, in my opinion, goes much further. It goes not just to asset ownership, but actually game ownership. So they will actually own part of the game. Right, and when you own something, you're obviously more likely to keep engaging with that, right? Because why would you play whatever Fortnite if there's a Web3 game that is maybe almost as good, but you're owning part of that? You feel more part of it, right? So the community focus is, I think, something that in Web3 is a huge advantage. And I also think because the big gaming studios, I mean, everybody's looking into the Web3 world um, of, of the big players, but um, um, I think the community aspect is, is something that um, only indie game developers can do. Because big companies, um, the Ubisofts, the Electronic Arts, and, and all of those, I mean, they have shareholders to report to, right? So if you look at it from a corporate structure, uh, the CEO will then you know, be worried about, okay, how is the value of our company um, progressing, and how is the reputation? That's, that's the two number two things um, that normally a, a CEO looks for, right? I mean, it's obviously earnings and, and revenues, and the second is reputation, because that's the second thing that shareholders don't like uh, besides profits. And um, in these studios, they can actually focus on, you know, more like, hey, let's build a game that the, that the community really likes, right? So being very close to the community itself, I think, is, is a huge benefit um, in, in order to um, have the stickiness of games and, and, and player retention. As far as adoption, I think it's all the parts that we spoke about before, right? Like if we are providing a user experience where you don't, you have the same onboarding process as a traditional game, that there is no friction, there is no bridging tokens from Ethereum to, to Polygon and, and, and you can buy with credit card and, and you don't need to set up any, any technical stuff, but everything is done in a very seamless way. I think that's, that's the part to adoption. And I think actually gaming is gonna be the, the Trojan horse of, of Web3 into this world um, uh, in general. I'm gonna have an unpopular opinion. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> so, um, uh, measuring and improving retention comes after user acquisition. And traditional games already automized most of the user acquisition with the available tools. Everything is very data-driven, targeted. They know how much money they, are, they need to spend to acquire a certain user and how much money they are gonna get from that, that user. Um, uh, if they get a certain retention rate. So uh, when in a game everything is very data-driven and analyzed, then you end up having all these type of uh, third-party products that helps you with retention rates, LTVs inside the game. Um, whereas Web3 games so far has been more focused on the blockchain usage and not focused on the user acquisition from the mass markets, from the uh, users that are not crypto native. Uh, I think this is the difference. Mm -hmm. If we have uh, necessary tools ready for game developers to, to have this game and onboarding process um, seamless, then they can move forward and focus on user acquisition, retention, 
and all these additional uh, metrics. Thank you. Um, I mean, the best thing for a game developer in order to like retain users is to just make a good game. Um, I think that the narrative is that you need to make a good game, right? Blockchain should not even be anything that anybody even knows about. Um, and we don't even need something like MetaMask popping up, right? And you clicking sign. Um, the, the, the wallet should just be generated. You tell the player to write down a seed phrase and, and then they just go and play. So I think that that's what we're missing because in blockchain, there's this the whole narrative of you, you buy this thing and then you get into the game world and then you earn this thing. And that's the stickiness. That's currently what Web3 gaming is right now, that there's a speculation that I'm going to play this game and I'm going to make money and that's why I'm sticking around. Um, that narrative needs to change where it's, it's a game first. You're playing the game because you like to, like Prospector's NFT, and I know the name NFT in it is probably wasn't the, the greatest choice because uh, we don't, uh, you, you don't need any you know, tokens. You don't need anything other than a wallet to, to play the game. And that, I think that's where we should go. But the next iteration of this, and after I get back from GDC, the, our next update is that you won't even need a wallet and you won't even know about it other than the first time that you write this down. And I think that the whole narrative, and I hope that in GDC and with all this Web3 talk is that we shouldn't even, the players shouldn't even know that they're on a blockchain. It should be the last thing. Um, and that's, I'm going to leave it as that. Yeah, totally agree. I also think, you know, the, the sticky, sticky blockchain games were really good at the economics, right? And they're good at like capturing that part of people's brains. They weren't capturing the players, but they're capturing the people that, you know, they're holding that token. They're part of that community and they're acquiring more NFTs. And that is powerful. It's like a powerful, like, you know, dopamine trap. <laughs> uh, but on the other side, the game, like, you know, to get someone without any monetary incentive to start playing a game and get in the feedback loop is, you know, the magic of game design, right? And I think, you know, I, I, what I like is all of you I know are working on putting those things together. And that's, I think, part of the real power of, of blockchain gaming. So, uh, so we're going to talk about UX. Um, we've already hit on this a bit, but I think it's really worth going into. UX to me is the absolute most critical component to this top of funnel and, and agreed we can't fix the retention until we actually get enough users at mass scale uh, to really focus on retention. But how do we uh, start creating a better UX? I think um, you hit on that uh, uh, there, but let's, let's take it one, one, one layer deeper because I think we have some, this isn't a beginner audience here today and if you're listening online later, uh, when I asked anyone, everyone if they played a blockchain game, I think almost every single hand was raised. I bet a lot of people here have also not just played them, but built them. So feel free to you know, get in the weeds and whoever wants to go for it, go for it. Um, I mean, with like a, a blockchain game, the, the biggest hurdle is that you have to first get the player who's, who know, has knowledge about blockchain onto the, this new chain, like switch their chain ID, have something like MetaMask basically change it for you. Uh, and then give them enough token or they already have this token in order for them to engage. Um, one thing that's good about scale, um, one, one of the reasons that we moved over to this is that the developer is responsible for you know, sending off these, the gas to pay for these transactions. And so there's no need for a user to hold the token, own the token or, or anything. They just need to have a Web3 enabled wallet. And that allowed us to onboard our users because they had already played blockchain games. So they already had a like MetaMask um, installed and all they had to do was just click play. It brings them over and they just started playing. And I think that that was the one part that allowed us to actually have these stickiness is that, well, they're like, wow, I didn't have to like buy anything beforehand. I didn't have, no, it's just, you just log in and start playing, you earn, the token in game and you use that in order to mint out an nft which is just like something that you would just own in a game world but now you have this persistency on chain that says that actually i own it and i've owned it for x amount of time which we just never really had in traditional games yeah i think um from the ux perspective another problem was that because of lacking of tools and products, uh, I think games have tendency to separate the marketplace from the actual game. So you need to like go to another place 
and get your NFTs and like do your transactions and then come back to the game, which is not an ideal user experience. Everything should happen inside the game throughout while I'm playing the game. Like it should be very seamless. Uh, I think this was like, especially on mobile because of a lot of um, limitations from uh, app stores and uh, some also technical limitations, uh, game developers um, uh, decide to like separate these two experiences, um, which is I think a big, big UX problem. I'm gonna maybe mention as an example of how we are dealing with user experience because it was literally the number one thing that we were worried about. Um, not only from, from, from a gaming perspective, but also you know, marketing-wise because you limit yourself extremely if you are you know, forcing a user to learn something, right? You will, you will spend so much more advertising costs um, um, compared to, to other games, which they're used to. They're used to it's very simple to start playing a game and get into it. So what we did was um, we were thinking, okay, how can we make this, this whole experience in a way that literally people don't feel that there is blockchain involved? However, still make sure that they gain the benefits that we spoke about earlier um, of, of this technology. So what we did was um, a user downloads the game. It's, it's a, it's a PC-based game. And we generate the wallet for him so that he doesn't need to set up anything. So he does not need to create MetaMask or any other wallet. It's done for him because it's, I mean, it's an algorithm, right? So he downloads the game, he automatically has the wallet, he holds custody, so it's all on his local machine. We have no access there, it's uh, on, his, on his computer. And uh, that's step one, because we don't wanna explain him, hey, look, you need a wallet here, right? Uh, then we went on and we were like, okay, well, how do we get the most users on this? If it's pay to play, that you have to buy a battle pass or buy, you know, you have to pay for the game, literally. Um, obviously that limits you as well, right? You can onboard less people if people have to pay for it. Uh, not only because not everybody is willing to pay, right? With all good free to play games out there, but also how do you do it in the crypto sense, right? We mentioned the NFT checkout solutions and the fiat on-ramp where you have like credit card uh, to use. So we were thinking, okay, well, let's do it in-game, right? So in, in our game, people can play for free and they can qualify for the pay-to-play. And the pay-to-play then is literally um, a credit card on-ramp. So you can basically buy um, uh, NFT avatars to, to progress in the game um, via your credit card. So, so this user experience is, is all tied in together because we want to be very independent of, of any friction, right? Because uh, our, our goal is not to to go into this um, 800, 900,000 um, crypto gamers and say, hey, how can we convert some of these? We're like, no, I mean, you know, the market is so huge, there's three billion gamers out there, let's just try to give them a user experience that is, is easy for them, right? And then make them understand the benefits because I think um, a gamer who is accumulating assets in the game because he's playing a lot and he's playing very well, um, he's much more likely to learn about blockchain if he sees like a token tracker there or an NFT that suddenly he understands, hey, well, hold on a second, this has value, right? I can sell it for, well, you know, for other cryptocurrencies or for US dollars. And I think then the motivation is, is higher to, to start learning about blockchain technology and, and certain other benefits. Yeah, um, totally agree. And I think, <clears throat> um, I think language is an important thing that we're figuring out as an industry. I mean, if you listen to all of us, we're all saying we're not going to say blockchain anymore. I would take the NFT out of the name, right? That kind of <laughs> stuff. And we're all deep, deeply native in it, right? And um, I mean, I think for me, the biggest aha moment was um, when Reddit released its um, its NFT collection, and uh, there was this one user who I, in my head, I just I like like nearly memorized what he wrote, which was uh, he's like, I'm so glad. Reddit didn't launch bullshit, scammy NFTs because those things are terrible. I'm so glad that they gave me a digital picture that I could buy to represent my membership in a community. <laughs> 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 and I, I just love that because like, I was like, that guy gets PFPs. That's amazing. Like, he, he knows he loves them. He would, he would, he would be a bored ape. Um, but uh, um, so I think like as an industry, like not focusing on the technology. Um, I read somewhere else that was a really good quote. It was saying that um, uh, saying you're an NFT artist is like saying you're an MP3 musician. 
Um, and uh, and I think as we're gonna we're gonna get away from these like technical words and, and just talk about game items and songs and art and the sort of underlying technology is is gonna go away. Um, and from the from the tooling perspective, if I can really get in the weeds, I think account abstraction, um, which is a big topic in the Ethereum community right now, and something you can actually build on chains like Scale um, with smart contracts now, um, is actually really huge too. Because um, even the, like the concept of a wallet or um, having a single point of failure for users is um, is like a really bad UX. And we're all kind of used to this idea of like, here's my account and here's my devices on an account. We do this with our banks um, and other things. And I think this ability to have uh, an identity on chain separate from your wallet, right? And so like we see uh, protocols like Lens Protocol doing this with profiles. Um, Ethereum is working on building it directly into the Ethereum protocol um, as account abstraction. And But you can also nowadays with something like Gnosis Safe and stuff, um, uh, approximate those now. And that, that's something that we have started to really build into our latest game. Um, this concept of like, I have my phone, um, I have my um, browser, and all of those are linked to my game profile. Um, that is, that is, and the game profile is what's accumulating the, the game assets. Awesome, great, great thoughts. Um, so we're gonna skip forward one because I feel like it, it's gonna fit better with the, the flow of the conversation. Um, we're gonna, let's talk about gamer segmentation. So I think if you go to like the big games, they really know their gamer audience, right? They're not trying to get people that play, you know, this first person shooter game to come over here and play this other game. They know who they're going after. I think in blockchain, and Dominic touched off on this a bit, that everyone's kind of fighting for this 800,000 wallets, but there's a billion other people out there you could go after. Um, so the question is, how do you think about segmentation and, uh, and specifically in two categories, like major AAA, like heavy gamers, and also casual gamers uh, in the browser world. And like, and who are you targeting if you are targeting one of those segments and how do you think about segmentation? That's a big question actually. Um, so um, I think in the, in the Web3 world, we ended up with a lot of people building games more interested in the sort of AAA, like, big game thing, um, but trying to go after that with the resources of an indie studio. Um, and it's gonna be really a tricky road, I think. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of, in sort of the macro gaming world, I think indie games are having, um, like they're becoming much bigger games, like with being able to reach uh, bigger audiences. Um, and I think that's actually a, a really good place for Web3 studios um, is to think about like, how can we be more indie? Um, we don't need to have, we don't need to compete on graphics. Um, let's, let's actually just make like fun games and focus on community or like whatever other aspects um, that the sort of Web3 can bring to it. Um, and I also think that um, macro wise, there's a pushback against the app stores and the technology shift where browsers are becoming um, way better at doing gameplay and graphics. Um, and uh, and uh, it's gonna be an interesting shift, I think, in the next coming years to see like how, how browser technology and delivering games through this new medium, basically, um, changes who plays and how they play and what games can do. Um, so I'm, that's a little different than your question, but I think like, the AAA big studios are going to be way slower to come into this world um, than the indie ones are, um, and uh, and that's because it messes with their business model basically. So when it comes to um, player segmentation, um, uh, we we looked at a couple of things. Um, on one hand, of course, um, where is the market? Right, like uh, what what is the market doing? Um, and, and what makes sense. Um, but then we also obviously, you know, try to find a good match with, with our own skill set. Um, so, so we from iBlocks, we actually we have a background in high frequency trading. So we are pretty good in, in managing latencies and, and core infrastructure in IT and, and things like that. So for us, it was like, okay, the decision was um, when we are building a game, latency is super important in, in competitive shooter games. It's what we are building. And um, shooter games are actually 
from a, from a core match loop, I'm not talking about the full game, but the match itself is, is pretty straightforward, right? There's not much to learn. You're on this map, shoot, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> yeah. that's it, right? Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things that go into that, um, and I don't want to simplify that, but um, um, from us, this was like like one of the one of the core aspects, and we looked at all of these these player types um, in general. So you have you know, according to many studies, you have like these these guys that want to socialize, right? Th those are the biggest communities. I think the socializers in Web3, you will always have because the community is the number one important thing in, in Web3 in general, right? So so that you, you can check off. You can check this off with a, a Discord channel in itself where people engage with each other. And in gaming, that's that's uh, probably the number one, the number one channel out there. Um, so socializers is, is, is already for any Web3 game thing, um, it's already there. Um, but then comes to the others, the, the explorers um, uh, is a big segment, uh, the competitive people. Um, and I think those are the main groups in there. And for us, we were like, okay, well, we're pretty good in infrastructure management and, and latency and all of these things. Um, we're also all very competitive in our office, so we enjoy playing against each other, and we literally want to say, hey, okay, let's do a match, you know, let's see, yeah, right? Yeah. So for us, the choice was quite easy from that end, and we knew we, ch we check off a couple of things in general with, um, with the way that, that things are built, but that made a lot of sense to us. Um, I think I look at this a little bit differently, like everyone is playing games one way or another. Uh, like my mom likes to play word games in their phone, in her phone, and I like playing video games. My boyfriend likes PlayStation games. So everyone's enjoying games of their choice. Um, I think uh, the important uh, part is that how do we acquire these, these uh, players from different platforms? Um, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about mobile uh, because that's... Uh, uh, mobile gaming is really big. They have millions of users. Um, there are a, a lot of big companies that are releasing mobile games uh, really often and then very successful. But there's, um, there's a tax from Apple and Google on Android and iOS. So uh, if you want to create a game economy based on in-game purchases or subscriptions, you give your 30% to the App Store. Um, if you want to create a game economy based on ads, um, then you're limited with, um, again, uh, on iOS, uh, some uh, privacy policies. Um, on Android, it's also coming up uh, this year or next year. They're working on a similar solution. So th they are kind of in trouble because, as I said, it's really difficult to acquire a new user, but also there are limited ways of generating revenue from your games. And I think it's, it, it could be an interesting and good target audience for, um, for Web3 and NFTs and tokens to be introduced to these users. They already have, they are already familiar with tokens or some uh, achievements inside the app, but they're not familiar with uh, the ownership of these. Um, so yeah, I believe mobile users are interesting and very promising uh, segment. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right on saying that you know mobile is basically the the next uh, you know fura into this. Uh, there's a ton of users, but there's there's certain game mechanics that don't really work well for uh, Web three. Like you're not going to do like a match three game mechanic. Um, and enable that with like Web three just doesn't really just just doesn't really make sense, right? Well, I mean, some people might try to do it, but I don't think it's a good fit at this current stage. I might be wrong. Please show me that I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so, like for prospectors, NFT, the game that like, I'm currently working on, we used a survival game mechanic, um, and we thought it was a good uh, a good game mechanic because there's a lot of players that understand the survival mechanisms of the gameplay um, and so there's certain assets like you get some rock, you know, make that 11 to 55, you know, the in-game currency, which is just a regular token, you could use use that for, and it just kind of made sense to to add these, you know, Web3 components to an existing game mechanic that was already out there and it's time and tested. Um, but in, in the, the continuation of like where like this is all going, is that the, the main narrative 
for me and I hope the one thing I'm going to like, you know, shout to the heavens at this at GDC this year is that if people know they're on a blockchain while they're playing a game, then we're losing. And that's the, the end result because there's a bunch of people that are outside of these doors at GDC and they will not even talk to you if you mention blockchain or Web3. It's like discussed to them. Um, so if we can't get to these players and say like, you know what, it's not about this buying thing and it's not about this underlying thing, like play this game. And it's like, are you playing a game? Is it fun? Yeah. Well, you know what? It uses Web3 technology. And I think it's the reversal of what we're trying to, um, you know, uh, relate to, to our to the actual like, real game players out there. Great thoughts. Um, speaking of mobile games, I think I had a borderline addiction at one point to Clash Royale, so I'd, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are sticky. Um, okay, so uh, if you have a question, you know, start thinking. We're going to go to the audience in a second, but one announcement, one thing coming up that you're working on. Um, uh, if you'd like to just tell the listeners out there, I know you are all working on very cool things. You have cool things coming up, so I'd love to love to hear it. Yeah, so uh, the next version of our game will be on mobile. Um, we're currently working on that uh, with quests. We finished the quest system and it's multiplayer. So we have uh, were able to do that. We couldn't release it for GDC because we just didn't want to do it. Um, but that's going to be the next thing that we're releasing and we're really excited. It's awesome. Um, we recently released MetaMask Unity SDK, which allows uh, any game on desktop, web or mobile that is built on Unity Engine to connect with MetaMask Wallet in an encrypted way. And it's the transporter of the MetaMask provider API. So you can um, do transactions or anything that uh, MetaMask API supports through this S SDK. Well, for us today was actually a big day because today was the first day that someone external could play our game. So um, we rushed it a bit to get, to get it done <laughs> until the GDC here. And, uh, but yeah, today was um, actually the, the beta testing launch. Uh, there's still a couple of things that, of course, we need to um, uh, adjust and improve and, and, and take a couple of bugs out. But um, it's, it's a pretty fun game already. Um, uh, we're enjoying it. Um, it. It was hilarious last week because um, we're, we're based in Dubai, 12 hours time difference didn't think about that because we're a multiplayer game. We're not, we're not having an environment to play against bots and all of this stuff. So Friday we realized, wait a second, <laughs> who's gonna do the night shifts now that we're in the game, right? Because we're here. And uh, so we split up the team. There's a couple of guys that are uh, playing at this time then so, so people can experience the game. And we added a couple of um, AI enemies because I cannot tell the whole team, hey guys, you know, midnight, yeah. right? Midnight to eight in the morning, uh, please game, right? I mean, yeah. that would slow down development as well. And um, yeah, so, so today was actually a very big day for so, us. So come to the scale booth and please go watch, see this game and you're gonna see, you know, we can't let them stay up till like, what, four in the morning without <laughs> people actually being able exactly. to interact and play with them. So we'll see you over there. <laughs> Yeah, and similarly, uh, at the booth, we uh, have our sort of pre-alpha game to Empire Gambit down there, um, which is um, uh, an update to an ancient Roman board game um, and built by generative AI, too. So we, um, we do a lot of experimentation with uh, sort of all the both art and text tools. Um, so we kind of mix blockchain, AI, and then all using it to update a very, very ancient game. Come and check it out in the scale booth too. Yeah, you can see all three of these games over the scale booth, so please come by. Um, all right, questions? All right, got one right here. So I heard you guys, um, so I, I'm, I'm Jacob with Hyperplay. Um, so I heard you guys share a lot of um, what, I, what I would consider pretty harsh critiques of wallets and, and wallet onboarding and to talk about the idea uh, that the user shouldn't experience the wallet or shouldn't onboard into the wallet and that the wallet should be embedded in the game or that the secret recovery phrase should happen inside of the game and that this is a path for onboarding. But I think, to, to be honest with you, like I wanna share like a, a critique that I think you're not actually onboarding these users into Web3 because their assets are siloed to those games. 
the wallets are not actually interoperable across games, which are where the majority of the actual value proposition for Web3 assets are. And so if, if we move in a pattern where we're, we're primarily just onboarding people into embedded wallets within games, they're not actually onboarding into Web3 and those, those assets are basically just secondary assets in games. But like Diablo did that in 2012. You don't actually need a blockchain for doing these things. And so like things like reputation and identity, like, um, I mean, do you, do you see value in the player having a wallet that's interoperable across every game? And I, I think that like, um, I, you know, I, I think that there are, there's like a, a bigger, more important debate that we should have whether our goals are actually to onboard, onboard people into the whole decentralized web or whether it's just um, generating transactions in a secondary market. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer first and I'm happy to pass it around to you. But um, one, I, like I, I, I agree with you a lot. And like, so, but <laughs> at any given moment, someone's gonna decide whether they wanna play a game, watch the dishes or whatever. And so any sort of friction that comes from, hey, I'm gonna go play this game is gonna detract from the ability to play that game. Now, that being said, um, we, for our tooling, um, I'll go into some deep technical stuff for a second. So what we do is when a player joins the game, they can either connect with their own crypto wallet or they can use uh, Web3 off decentralized, like login with Google or whatever like that. We deploy a Gnosis safe for that user. Um, and then we connect that wallet that they use for signing as an owner of that Gnosis safe. Which means though that they have a fully on-chain identity that they can connect a different wallet to and reclaim that from wherever they want. That wallet really belongs to them. It is not our wallet as an embedded game. They can hook up MetaMask, um, they could hook up Rainbow Wallet or whatever and control that Gnosis safe on their own. But meanwhile, um, I think I don't, there's gotta be a word for this, maybe someone else knows, like a progressive chainification or something like that, right? Like um, let people play um, and then say, oh, hey, now you have an NFT. What's an NFT, right? Like onboarding is a can be a slow process and some people won't care about it and that's fine, just let them enjoy the game. Uh, otherwise, like, yeah, look, if you want, like, let's make them degen. Like, like, I'm pretty proud of what we did with our original game, bringing those folks from Coinbase on chain. And now some of those folks have gone off and like, they come back and say like, thank you so much. You taught us so much about, you know, what the chain is. And so I think games have this really opportunity to connect with people in a different way than like docs or like starting with the wallet does. Instead, let's start with an experience and then show them what a wallet is. I think it's not even about wallets. Um, what, you, what you mentioned um, is mainly interoperability, I think, right? And um, from that perspective, I think um, there's maybe this misconception of interoperability in general, because um, the critics of, of, of interoperability in, in Web3 gaming say, oh, but show me a game where this gun you can use in this other game, right? Right now, that literally doesn't, doesn't really exist yet. I, I think this is gonna come because games will benefit from, from that uh, enhanced user base. However, <coughs> it is actually already interoperable in a, in a general sense, because when you compare it to Web2 gaming, Today, you do not have the situation that you can play whatever game A, let, let's say you play um, Call of Duty right now, and tomorrow you say, hey, wait a second, I wanna play Assassin's Creed now. Let me sell my Call of Duty membership quickly and buy the Assassin's Creed membership, and then I play this game, right? That's literally right now not possible. You have to buy this and you have to buy that. And if you don't like Call of Duty anymore, and then you basically, you lost that, that, that asset, that money, right? In Web3, with the way things are built already, and, and this is not something in the future, this is already existing, right? Um, you can literally then sell your assets, and then with these assets, with the, with the returns, you can then buy the new membership of the different games. So indirectly, it's already interoperable with a, with a benefit that you can go from game A to game B. Um, and I think in the future, it will be directly integrated. I mean, if I think you should answer first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I guess my perspective is going to be a bit different. Like at Chainsafe, we work on I work on Web three Unity, and we try our best to incorporate every you know solution that allows you to connect to Web three. Um, now, the I guess like on a on a higher level, it's like well, 
what what do, what do we as a game as like blockchain game developers um, expect our our users to to do with these assets that they're that they're get, getting in the game, right? Um, I don't design blockchain games for the thought of speculation on an asset. I design a blockchain game, and they have the same core um, like functionalities that a traditional game would have. It's just that in my look at the world, and it might be very narrow. Um, it's that like if a server goes down, what assets do I want my my players to still have after that's done? Because I'm coming from a world where I used to play games, and then they don't like the game anymore, and then they shut the server down, and I lose all my stuff, and I don't want to lose my stuff anymore. So if I have to associate my stuff with a wallet, then I'm fine with it. Whether it's MetaMask, whether it's integrations with you know, Hyperplay and all these other different awesome. Uh, um, players that are in that space. I just want to own my assets when the server goes down. That's all I care about, right? And if they want to call it an NFT or a non-fungible avatar or call it like an ERC-20 token, I don't care. I just, do, I just want to make sure that I still have my stuff when the servers go down. And that's why I got into the blockchain game space itself was to, like, to um, aid players in the sense that they can care, have owned their assets um, and currently, we did we we didn't have that before. We never like what do what could we as game developers really say that we owned, right? Like we didn't own anything, and now we have the ability to own our assets. So that was that's the most important thing to me. Okay, awesome. So we're we're up on time. Can I can oh, yeah, I yeah, add please, one of thing? Course, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, um, yes, currently there is no option to have embedded wallets, or uh, even if there is, it's. A little bit tricky to to actual give actual ownership and presence to the user, um, but via MetaMask SDK, we are actually planning to um, um, improve the onboarding uh, of the user into the wallet, at the same time into the game. Um, that is almost like an embedded wallet experience. Yeah, and I think I think this is a great question to end on because this calls out the one of the biggest challenges in crypto and is decentralization and UX pull at each other. They're diam diametrically opposed uh, as a security. So, um, but I think that you know we heard some great answers there. I'd welcome anyone who wants to talk more. We can funnel out into the hall and continue this conversation. But um, all uh, all challenges on the path to getting to you know real scalable growth for Web three. And all right, everybody, thank you. Thank you.